expects us to have good church. Amen? Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, or navigate in your Bible app to Mark chapter 5. It's so different now. When I first started preaching, uh, I could hear pages turn, and you, you know, the you don't want that awkward silence in your message as people are getting there to their to the scripture, and so you just kind of fill the time while you heard the pages turn. Then when you stopped hearing the pages turn, you okay, now we're going to read. Can't do that anymore, you know, because it's like people are either there or they don't know where to find it, you know, and so just got to look at the screen, I guess. Anyway, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And we had come out of the boat, speaking of Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar, he ran and worshipped him. When he saw Jesus afar, he ran and worshipped him. And I'm just going to stop reading right there. And I'm going to ask you one question. Who do you worship today? Who do you worship? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you tonight or this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would move in a mighty way. I pray, God, that you would help me to flow in your anointing, that, Lord Jesus, our hearts, our minds, and our very lives would be changed by the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. I thank you, God. Move in a mighty way here this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And could you one more time worship the Lord with me by lifting your hands and lifting up your voices, God? We praise you and we worship you when we lift up the name that is above every name right now, Jesus. We praise and we worship the name, God. We thank you for your name, Jesus, that will set us free. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you. You can be seated. Who do you worship this morning? Whether you claim to be religious or not, whether you claim to be emotional or not, whether you claim to be a child of God or not, you worship somebody, you worship something. Every man worships something, and I believe that it is inherent in our, our genetic makeup somehow, some way, that, that every man, every woman, every child has been built with this desire to worship something greater than themselves. And it doesn't take long to realize if you begin to get to know a person what they worship. There are people who worship causes. There are people who worship ideologies. There are people who worship figures. There are people who worship idols. There are people who worship sports stars and actors and actresses. There are people, unfortunately, even who worship politicians. There are people who worship judges. There are people who worship bankers and CEOs and all of those things. And and you can tell that they worship somebody by the way that they behave and the way that they talk about certain things. Some people worship sports teams. Some people worship sports. Some people worship activities. Some people worship leisure the idea of not doing anything, and, and, and people put all their time and their money into to what they're going to do after they retire. I read a funny statement on the Internet this week. It said some people talk about what they're going to do after they retire. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to work until lunch on the day of my funeral. <laughs> but there is, there is an inherent need in your life to worship this morning. And we talk about worshiping God, but we have to understand something, that God does not own our worship. That's, that's very important. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
He, the Bible says that he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, but he does not own our worship. For if he did, it would not truly be worship. Worship is something that is given of your own free will. You, you freely worship something. You cannot be forced to worship anything. Even if you're subjugated and, and, and forced to live under a certain regime or a certain ideology, you, can, you still are not actively worshiping that thing if you're doing it begrudgingly. That's why worship is, is a free will offering. The idea of, of a worship offering in the, in the Old Testament was something that wasn't, um, it wasn't required by the law. It was something that was brought on your own. And there were specifics of how you brought it and what you could bring, but there was still, it, was, it wasn't required. And so we, we see this story about uh, this, this man in Mark chapter 5 who is called Legion. Uh, if you read the rest of the story in Mark chapter 5, his name is Legion, and he's called that because he is possessed with a legion of demons. I want to just make one simple point here. Um, in the military operations of Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Julius Caesar, a legion was composed of ten cohorts, with four cohorts in the first line, three each in the second and third lines. The 3,600 heavy infantry were supported by enough cavalry and light infantry to bring the legion's strength up to 6,000 men. 6,000. And this time period that we're talking about is not very long after the life of Julius Caesar. And so uh, when this man says that he is possessed by a legion of devils, everybody in the area that heard that understood the numbers. They understood to a certain point how many demons he was talking about. And so there's 6,000 demons living inside of this man, and you think you might have some problems. If you've got, if you're possessed of one devil, you've got a problem. Let me just, I don't mean to to be a jerk this morning, but if you're demon-possessed, you got problems. And uh, if you're demon-possessed by 6,000 demons, you've got uh, exponential problems that, that need to be dealt with. The Bible says that they tried to tame this man. They tried to chain him. They tried to, to get him to calm down, but they couldn't do it because he had an entire legion of demons inside of him that gave him supernatural strength, that gave him the ability to do things that the common person just couldn't do. They, they say that they would put shackles on him, which are feet irons, and he would rip them apart. They would put chains on him, and he would break the chains. Most people can't do that right, without some sort of supernatural help. But the Bible says that when he saw Jesus afar, he ran and he worshipped him. He went to this place where Jesus was and he fell down and he worshipped him. Your worship does not belong to God and neither does it belong to the devil. There were 6,000 demons inside of this man and they could not stop him from falling to his knees and beginning to worship Jesus Christ. There was this beautiful picture of the subjugation of this um, this man with, with 6,000 demons and he still fell to his knees in complete surrender to Jesus Christ. He was worshiping him. I'm not talking this morning about uh, just about praising like we think. Praise and worship are two different things. But I do want to make this point that you can praise the Lord without worshiping Him, but you cannot worship the Lord without praising Him. So people that say that they worship the Lord but never lift their hands are not worshiping the Lord. People that say that they worship the Lord and never grace the church with their presence are not worshiping the Lord. People that say that they worship the Lord and aren't, aren't, aren't willing to clap their hands when they feel the presence of God, they're not really worshiping the Lord. Because you cannot worship the Lord without praising Him. Because when you praise Him, you're lifting Him up. You're getting the focus off of yourself. <laughs> True worship is not about you. It's not about you and, and your pity problems. It's, it's about exalting and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. That's what real worship is. And so I'm asking you again today, who are you worshiping? John chapter 4. 
and verse 23. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So he's not looking for people to praise him necessarily. He's looking for people to worship him. And if you're truly worshiping him, you will praise him. Now, we are, I, I, I said already that we, we all worship something. Now, I, I noticed something. You only get what the object of your worship can give. Okay, so let me explain. You can only get whatever you're worshiping is capable of giving. Okay, so let's say I worship Michael Jordan, excellent basketball player, millionaire. I think he's, I think he's up over a billion now. Um, you know, he, he just an absolute wonderful basketball player on the basketball court. And if I were to worship him, I, I would uh, get his shoes, I would get his jersey, I would get, you know, some of his lines of clothing, maybe put a poster on my wall of Michael Jordan, right? And, and I, would, I would look at that poster every day, and I would think, man, that's awesome. And I could maybe rattle off the statistics of Michael Jordan. I can't because I don't really know that much about Michael Jordan. Uh, but let's say that I did, and, and I could rattle off the statistics to you, and I could tell you how many points he scored per game and, and what his average rebound was per game and, and, and where he made his best shots from on the court and, and, and all those kinds of things. I could tell you all those things, and I would be worshiping him. And the only thing that he could ever really give me, though, if I was really lucky, is maybe a chance to sit down with him and eat dinner. Right? And then, and then look at it on the other end of the, the, the spectrum. Uh, if, if we worship politicians, maybe the only thing they could ever give us would be a bill that passed that we thought should be passed. Or if we worshiped a CEO, then, then maybe he would, he would give us a job in his company. Or, or if we worshiped a, a, a Hollywood actress, maybe the, the best we could ever do is read about them in the tabloids because that's all they're capable of giving them. You're going to get what you worship. You're going to get uh, everything that they're capable of, of giving you. And that may be the problem with most of the world is that we're worshiping the wrong things and we're getting all that they can give us. And so the, this man in, in Mark chapter 5, when he fell down and worshipped Jesus, he got everything that Jesus could give him. He was given something that the rest of the world could not give him. And the Bible says he fell and he worshipped Jesus there. There's a, there's a beautiful picture of this man on his knees begging Jesus that he could be free of these demons. And, and he's worshipping Jesus. And because he is worshipping Jesus, Jesus, he gets everything that Jesus was capable of giving him. So, that begs the question then. <laughs> what can God give you? What can Jesus give you? I, I thought of, of Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas, at this point in Scripture, have come into prison. They've been thrown into prison because they were preaching the gospel and, and um they're they're in the midst of this massive revival and and the the city there has has heaped up these big pile of books about witchcraft and they burn them and and the people that made idols in that city are mad and so they, they throw Paul and Silas into jail because they're losing their income. It's really what's going on, Acts chapter sixteen. Right, and so um, they they have their feet fast in the stocks. And in verse twenty four, we pick up who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison to make their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, had they been worshiping Caesar, they would have got what Caesar may have given them. They may have gotten a pardon. 
But they weren't worshiping Caesar. They were worshiping God. And so in the midst of their prison, they start to sing praises unto God. And they start to to lift up his name to a point where the other prisoners hear them. Worship is not a silent thing. I don't believe in this, this concept of just silent genuflection before God. This... I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. When I, when I look in the, in the Bible, Psalm chapter 47, it says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. That doesn't sound like this. Or make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. That's not. There's got to be, I mean, truly, if you're really worshiping God, you would be willing to lift up your voice, would you not? I mean, if we really believed the message that we preached, that that God has just forgiven us of our sins and, and pulled us literally out of the grasp of hell, I don't think that we would just sit there silently by when the presence of the Lord is moving. I, I find it hard to believe that somebody can sit there in the midst of an apostolic service and feel the presence of the Lord start to move and sit there like a bump on a log and wonder why nothing is happening in their life. Start worshiping God and you'll start getting what God can give you. Paul and Silas were in the middle of prison. They were in the middle of of the worst trial of their entire lives at that point, and they had been thrown into prison for doing what was right and were wrongfully accused, and they were probably, they, they had been beaten, and so they have stripes on their back, they're, they're stuck up against the wall, and the Bible says that they sang praises to God in the middle of the prison. God doesn't own your, God doesn't own your praise. Even if you're in the middle of the prison, God doesn't own your praise. Even if you're in the middle of the worst trial of your life, God still doesn't own your praise. And, and I'm, I'm here to let you know that, that there is some power in the, in the ability or the willingness to lift up the name of Jesus Christ in the middle of a trial. There's something about the, the faith that is built in the child of God that is willing to lift up their hands in the midst of the storm, that they're willing to lift up their hands despite the prison, that they're willing to, to say loud enough so that other people would hear them and sing loud enough so that all the other prisoners would understand what they're saying in the midst of their prison. Because the fact is, even though Paul and Silas were in prison, God was still worthy to be praised. Your circumstance does not dictate whether or not God is worthy to be praised. Right? So in the midst of the prison, God was still worthy to be praised. When you're standing on the mountaintop, God's still worthy to be praised. When service is great, God is still worthy to be praised. When service is not so great, God is still worthy to be praised. When you're in the midst of the worst trial of your life, God is still worthy to be lifted up and to be praised and adored. When you're in the best time of your life and it's never going to get any better, God is still worthy to be praised no matter what. And I wish we could separate and do divorce ourselves from this idea that I'm going through it so I'm not going to lift up my hands. I'm not worthy to lift up my hands. Well, nobody is. When we stop to think about it, nobody is worthy of it. And so Paul and Silas, in the midst of their trial, began to praise and to worship the Lord. The Bible says that the prison broke up. The foundations of the prison broke up. They started to to worship God and they got everything that God could give them. Freedom. Salvation. There was this wonderful, this wonderful miracle that took place in the Philippian jail that nobody left even though they had the chance to leave and the Philippian jailer and his entire house were, were born again and baptized in Jesus' name, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, because God gave them what he was capable of giving them. 
God is capable of giving you things this morning that, that other people are not capable of giving you. I'm, I think when, we, when it comes to worship, there's no other person in the entire Bible that can write it quite like David did. I was reading Psalm chapter 103, which is an absolute masterpiece of a psalm. And there's this, this wonderful, uh, there's these beautiful truths that are in there. And he said in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And there lies the secret to worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Everything that is within me, bless his holy name. There's, there's a part of you that nobody else is allowed to get to, that secret place that, that nobody else knows about, not even your spouse. But when you're willing to put that part forward and begin to worship the Lord, you're going to see mighty things in your life. You're going to see awesome things in your life. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives you of all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Forget not the benefits of God. I'm here to let you know when you begin to worship God, you're going to get everything that He is capable of doing. Forget not His benefits this morning, church. He healed your body. He forgave you of your sins. He redeemed your life from utter destruction. He crowned you with loving kindness and blessed you with some tender mercies in your life. He said, Satisfied your life with good things uh, and things that nobody else in this world uh, could give you. There ought to be a praise and a worship uh, that begins to well up in the side uh, and in the soul of some people here that begin to remember all the benefits uh, of what God has done for them in their life. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. I will hold nothing back when I worship God. I will hold no part of my life back from this worship because I remember the benefits that God has given to me. And when I start to think about the Lord, there's something that wells up inside of me that I just cannot stay silent. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we praise you and we lift you up. We worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Some of us probably wouldn't be sitting here in this building if it had not been for the Lord. Some of marriages that are sitting together may not be together if it had not been for the Lord. Some people would be walking around in utter destruction had it not been for the Lord. Some people would not have loving kindness on their life and experience tender mercies. Some people's lives would be in utter shambles had it not been for a worship session when they got a hold of the Lord God Almighty. Some people in this place, you got to think about how awful your life might be had you not came into contact with Jesus of Nazareth. I'm here to let you know that he's here in this place this morning, that if you still need some of that capability in your life, I know a God who's standing here waiting for somebody to fall down on their knees and just begin to worship him again. Oh, hallelujah. 
The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 118 verse 24, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't matter what the day holds. It doesn't matter what the schedule says. I'm still going to wake up with the idea that I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Not because things are going my way. Not because everything's the way it should be. But because I have a God somewhere in heaven that made this day. And because he made it, I'm going to lift him up. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 100 and verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. We lose something there. Let me tell you in the Hebrew, that means to shout with a purpose. That means to shout with triumph. That means to shout in applause. It means to shout with joy. It means to shout like you just won a battle, whether or not you've ever even fought it yet or not. I'm here to let you know that we as apostolics cannot ever lose our our shout because the moment we lose our shout we lose the capability of what God is able to do in our life and now I understand why the Bible says in Psalm 47 and verse 1 clap your hands all ye people and shout unto God with a voice of triumph shout unto him with a voice of triumph not a voice of defeat not a voice of it might happen but a voice of triumph I have a God I have a God this morning that is capable of doing anything I need him to do. If I have sin, he can forgive me. If I have disease, he can heal me. If I have addiction, he can break it. If I have depression, he can give me joy. If I have anything that I feel is threatening to me, I have a God who can take care of it with just one simple worship session. Psalm chapter 100 and verse 4. Into his, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. God is looking this morning for somebody that's willing to worship him. But you don't... We have to understand... God cannot extract worship from you through some divisive means. True worshipers do not need a cheerleader to stand in front of them and say, let's worship God in one, two, three. True worshipers do not need as somebody to goad them to say, you know what, uh, uh, I think we ought to worship God for the next five minutes. A true worshiper, when he just begins to think about the Lord and everything that God has done for him, there's something inside of that soul that begins to well up that comes from no other place in this world but an absolute thankfulness that says, Oh God, I've come here to worship you. I've come here to lift up your name. I've come here to bless you this morning. I believe that God wants to do wonderful things in this altar this morning. I honestly believe that anything can happen because when you begin to truly worship God, your faith goes to the next level. That when you begin to worship God, the doubt that you have starts to dissipate in your mind. And when you really start to worship God the way that you're supposed to, and you're willing to give your emotions to God and cry out and say, God, I love you. And you're willing to stand at an altar and not afraid to look like a fool in front of everybody else, but it's just between you and God. Your faith starts to build. There's a, a level of faith 
that is here this morning because we've been worshiping God. It's not a faith in me, but I believe it's a faith in God and his capabilities. And I believe if you would just worship God this morning, no matter what it is, God is capable of taking care of it this morning. No matter how bad it might seem in your life, I know there's nobody here possessed with 6,000 demons. And if they can't stop a man from bowing down and worshiping God, why should we allow anything else to separate us from God's love? Why should we separate and allow anything else to stop us from lifting up the name of Jesus Christ? And therein lies the difficulty because the devil knows that when you begin to worship the Lord, when you begin to praise the Lord, when you really begin to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, that your faith starts to build, that your faith starts to take on the next level, that your faith starts to go places and take your mind places that you've never been before. And the devil understands this. And if he can just get you to be silent, he doesn't even have to get you to backslide. But if he can get you to be silent... When the presence of God is moving, then he's already won. Because he can keep you in the same place you have always been for the rest of your life. I don't need them to backslide. I don't need them to leave the church. I don't need them to, I don't need them to be awful people. They don't even need to be sinners, quote unquote. All I've got to do is stifle their worship and then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to just keep them right where they are. When I think of true worship, and I, I don't mean to be funny, I was preaching this youth rally in um, Watertown, New York. <clears throat> it's a youth rally, right? So there's a bunch of youth there. And I look out, and sitting about right here, I, I see this break in the audience. You know, everybody's standing, everybody's moving, church is bumping, and, and things are going great. And I see this break in the audience. You know, all these young people standing there, and there's, there's this, like, empty spot, I think. And I, see, I, I start to look over there, and there's this little old lady sitting there. And I'd find out later she was 98 years old. And she's sitting there. And, and the presence of God is moving. And man, people are worshiping God. And she's, she makes she does whatever she can just to get up. And she grabs her walker. 98. Grabs her walker. And makes her way out into the aisle. And starts shuffling. And starts just moving. And, and uh, the pastor at the time, or the Simmons, he leaned over to me and he said, Sister so-and-so is about to run the aisles. And she gets out there, and she's taking a step. And it takes every last ounce of, of strength that she has in her because she's 98 years old. But she's doing everything she can. And she's just shuffling as fast and as hard as she can because there was something inside of that Holy Ghost-filled elderly woman that said, while the rest of these young people are content to sit here in their comfort zone, I'm going to get out of this place, and I'm going to do whatever I can to worship God. If you can hold a 98 year old woman back with a walker why should we who have the ability to stand why should we who have the ability to lift our voice and have the strength to lift our hands and to scream and to shout unto the Lord be outdone by a 98 year old woman with a walker I'm here to let you know that God will give you what you, he's capable of giving you. But it isn't until you worship God. It isn't until you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and say, I'm going to do something different by just worshiping the Lord. I believe God is in this place here this morning. Could you stand with me? Could you worship the Lord right now? Could we just lift up his name and make this place a habitation for his spirit? Oh, hallelujah. I believe God's going to do something in your life this morning. 
I believe God's going to set you free this morning. I believe God's going to break your chains this morning. I believe God's going to give you the Holy Ghost this morning. I believe God's going to heal you this morning. I believe God is going to let you know that he's still with you. He's still here. It doesn't matter what it is in your life. I believe there's a God in this place that wants to do great and mighty things. What are you worshiping this morning? Who are you worshiping this morning? Who are you worshiping? I believe God is going to do a great thing in your life. But you've got to be willing to do what that little 98-year-old woman did. I've got to get out of here and I've got to worship in a way I never have. I remember being in the the prayer room one night before church, and and I don't mean to point fingers, so I'm not going to tell you who it was. But I remember someone praying, God, give us good worship tonight. Okay. God, give us good worship tonight. I wanted to stop the person and say, wait, 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 wait. That's not how it works. God doesn't give you worship. He doesn't possess worship. That's why he is searching to and fro. That's why the Bible says he seeketh such that would worship him in spirit and in truth. People that are willing to put their emotion on the line, willing to put their pride on the line. I'm not talking about being crazy. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about being destructive. No, none of that. What I'm talking about, I used to, I used to think that a lot of, and, and I know this is ironic coming from me who grew up in Pentecostal church, but I used to think a lot of things that happened were emotionalism, right? <clears throat> and I remember reading that verse in Psalm chapter 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord. O my soul, and all that is within me. And being convicted, how in the world does a psalm about praise convict you? Because I felt God telling me, you're holding some things back. You're holding your joy back. You're holding your emotion back. And so when we we separate emotion from worship... It's not worship. Because you have to worship with everything that is within you. And so this little old lady that got out and started to shuffle the aisles, this man who was possessed with 6,000 devils, I can't imagine that that was an emotionless plea. I don't think that was an emotionless worship. I think there was something inside of him that welled up, that that part that not even 6,000 devils could get to. That purely human emotion that he and he alone possessed, but that God is looking for in true worship. Came out and said, let me be free. I just want to be free. Paul and Silas it wasn't some liturgical riff raff thing that was written in a book somewhere that they they had to just recite some recitations from some songbook somewhere that that had no meaning to them. It was actual worship to the point that they put their energy into it enough where the other prisoners heard them. They began to worship the Lord. God wants to give you, wants to do for you what He's capable of doing here this morning. And so I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar and ask God to do things for you. I just want you to come and just worship God. To shout with a voice of triumph, to to praise God as if it's already been done, to to lift up the name of Jesus Christ as if you're already free, to to sing like like you've already been set free, to worship like God has already done it for you, to dance like you've already been healed.
to lift your hands like you got no problems in the world and just start to worship the Lord. I'm not talking about denying the reality. I'm talking about just getting in a different dimension and letting God do what He's capable of doing by worshiping Him. Can we lift our hands right now? Just begin to worship the Lord. Can we be we can we begin to just cry out to God right now? Just begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Could we just begin to tell God how much you love Him? Could you just begin to worship Him in your the best way that you know how? Could you just begin to, to let Him know that He's your God? Could you just begin to, to praise Him and just lift Him up and tell Him He's holy, that you love Him? People are going to get healed this morning. People are going to get set free this morning. I want, I want the presence of God to be capable of moving in this place. I want God to know and to understand that there's nothing stopping the moving of His Spirit in this place. He doesn't own your worship. Could you give it to Him right now? Are you willing, are you willing to get loud when nobody else is? Are you willing to, to clap your hands when nobody else is? Are you willing to come to the altar if nobody else is going to come? Let's worship the Lord. Come on, church. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we lift up your name, God. I thank you, God. We worship you in this place, God. You're worthy to be praised, whether we're going through the storm or not. You're worthy to be lifted up, God. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I praise you, God. We praise your name, Lord Jesus. We lift you up, God. I thank you, Jesus. I worship you, God, as being the God of my life. I worship you, Jesus, for being the one that forgave me of my sins. I worship you, Jesus, for being the one that filled my body with the Holy Ghost. I worship you, Jesus, for being the healer of all my diseases. I worship you, Jesus, for setting me free from depression. I worship you, Jesus. Come on, church, let's lift up our voice right now in this place.